I don't think sexual abuse exists. Really? I don't think physical abuse exists. I don't think psychological abuse exists. I don't think any. I think there's only one kind of abuse. If it's happened to you, there's a reason, whether it's obvious or subconscious. So, and you so just meaning there's meaning. Always meaning. There's only one abuse. It's someone's spirituality being abused. So then what happens? Your spirit is broken. It's not whole. And by bringing like, truth to a situation, that's the, way, that's the way we heal it. Welcome to the In Search of More podcast. I am your host, Ellie Nash. Join me weekly on my quest for more. More from myself and more from this world. We'll see you on the other side. Here we go. So, Ryan, in our uh, earlier conversation, you brought up sexual abuse a little bit. I said, let's stick a pin in it. It's definitely something I want to uh, dive into, sexual abuse, but I think it's its own conversation. Yeah, I still got some unpacking to do there. On sexual abuse? Yeah. Like, what is it? Just how you framed it, you know, um, because my thought on it was sexual abuse kind of looks like this, right? So for the listeners, I'm kind of making this box with my hands. Like, it it fits inside of that, it's sexual abuse, but anything outside of that is not... Um, and just listening to what you said in our earlier conversation, it's um, your sexuality being abused. is like a completely different perspective for me now. Right. I actually share a conversation I once had with um, someone who sexually abused um, that I knew of and that he acknowledged on the phone with me, four different children. And he made some, he, he said a lot of bizarre things, but... Um, I'll, I'll bring the, uh, you and the audience into one of those things he said. So of the four, there was one, and this was when I was working with Jewish Community Watch, and mm -hmm. you know, there was a lot of victims who would come to the organization um, looking for support for their abuse, and some of that included confronting the abuser. Sometimes even further than that, exposing, publicly exposing the abuser. So in this case... Um, I don't like the language, the abuser, the, the person who abused them. And in this case, one of the four who came to the organization said that they were raped by this man. And he took the approach, he said, I want you to know I never raped anybody. I said, first of all, I don't believe you. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. No offense, but you did the other stuff, so what would stop you from lying? I, right. You know. I went this far, but I didn't go that far. Like this kid has a little bit more credibility than you, but let's, so I don't believe you, but let's take you at your, what you're saying. So what? So what? And this is what I asked him. I said, when do you think the damage happened? Because let's talk about what did happen. What did happen is he ingratiated himself to this child over an extended period of time, which means what? They, they call it grooming. What does it mean ingratiating themselves to the, the child is they made the child believe this relationship was something else. In a child's innocence, they made the child believe that this relationship was coming from love. And really, what was the relationship about? Sex. Right. And eventually getting the child comfortable enough to do a sexual act with this person. That was the goal. So I said, let's say you were stopped before the abuse happened. Do you think that child has no damage? What was his response to that? <laughs> I didn't understand what I was talking about. He had no, you know, he wanted what he wanted from, uh, from the phone call and anything. I, I went to a therapist and the therapist said, I'm not asking what a therapist said. I'm asking just a normal person. Anyone. This child is being groomed for a period of time. He finds out at some point this relationship is an attempted, the person attempts to do something. The child stops it, gets away. What do you think happens to that child? It's at that moment. So my argument is at that moment, that's where abuse happens. Because the second the child understands that these interpretations that I was making of this being a loving relationship, sincere interest in me, is not. It's at that moment that the sexuality becomes abuse. It's at that moment that the abuse took place. There's a dimension where you can say at that moment that there's even, you know, interest or something else. But... I, that's not something that we do, that it, someone would necessarily even comes to ter comes to term terms with. What I'm saying is, is that if there was an attempted, someone was groomed for a period of time, and there was an attempt to abuse them, there was damage done to that person at that time of the attempt, whether or not the person was successful. What is that damage? And that's that damage. A child's innocence 
It's now interrupted. Now, everything else that happened, of course, there's a difference whether there was an actual rape or not an actual rape. Of course, that's more damage. It's, 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 you know, it's, uh, you know, additional layers and levels to the abuse and the frequency of it and the intensity of it and who that person was to them. Was it a, a relative, a non-relative, right. a, a religious figure, a non-religious figure? All those things are going to layer on top of that. But at its core, what we're talking about is robbing someone of their trust and their innocence. Anyway, back to sexual abuse. So what, what I'm going to say is that I don't think sexual abuse exists. Really? I don't think physical abuse exists. I don't think psychological abuse exists. I don't think any. I think there's only one kind of abuse that exists. You're saying a lot here, Ali Nash. I'm saying you got to unpack here. this for me. Yes, there's only one kind of abuse. And let me put something on the side before I say this. I'm not talking about, let's say, someone who is injured. If someone was, is left with an injury, they lost a limb or something else, we're not using the word. We wouldn't use the expression, this person was physically abused. This person was injured in an okay. attack. Right? We, it, w it wouldn't describe what we're talking about. If I say that this, oh, this guy was very physically abused as a child and he showed up missing a leg, right. you wouldn't feel like I described him correctly, right? Like right. really describe what he went through. Right, right. I would have to use more language to adequately describe it. Right. So when I say this person was very physically abused as a child, what am I talking about? Someone, someone who looks normal. Right. right? On its face, that you don't see the abuse. Are you saying it's, on, it's happening on the inside? That's what I'm saying. When we say the damage that takes on, so what is it touching? What are we talking about that this was abused? Only one thing. Which the is? Spirit. Mm. Talk spirit. about it. So there's only one abuse. It's someone's spirituality being abused. And um, they're, not spirituality, wrong word, their spirit being abused, right? The spirit, whatever it is that houses us, our life force, the difference between um, a body that's alive and a body that's dead. What is that inside them? Whatever you use for, for that, if you're religious or non-religious, doesn't make a difference. That, that right. thing inside all of us, that, that, that our light. essence. Yeah. Call it a soul, call it a spirit. Well, we know what we're talking about. Right. Right. Everyone, everyone understands talking about that's the only thing that could be abused. Mm. And that can be abused in multiple ways. I Meaning there can be a pathway into the spirit. So what are different pathways into the spirit? Physically, someone can be abused. But I've spoken to people, for example, who were um, hit periodically by their parents. I wouldn't compare it there, and I'm not comparing abuse necessarily, that's a separate conversation, but if you told me just on its face that someone over the course of their childhood um, was hit one time, I would think they probably are doing okay. Right. But if you told me that a child was sexually abused one time, I wouldn't think they're doing okay. Why not? Yeah, what is that difference? I think that pathway into the spirit is a lot shorter. When, you, when you're going through the avenue of sex, to, when someone is going through the avenue of sex to abuse someone else, that pathway is like a, a micro pathway. When you're going through the physical body, it, just, it takes longer. Someone who's sustained over a period of time physical abuse, they're going to show similar symptoms to someone who sustained sexual abuse one, two, or three times. Yeah. Uh, I think I agree with that. I think, yeah, just going back to our earlier conversation and the the intimacy, that energy that's co connected to sexuality, that that fire, um, it's easy to spot, easy to target, easy to get to. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I think once is one too many times if if that sexuality gets abused. Yeah, it's it's the most it's the most precious. And sometimes we associate sensitivity with weakness. It's not. It's not all the time. We always do, but you know, the way I, uh, <laughs> what I've told every single one of my sponsees when I'm working with them, I said, we're dry clean only. <laughs> we're like velvet. So much more expensive, <laughs> right, than cotton. But you can throw cotton in a washing machine, it's going to survive. Would you say it's better than velvet? No. But you got to dry clean this. You put it in a washing machine and this thing gets, right, it's, right, it's hammered. So children are like that. Children are velvet. Dry clean only. You got to. We got to take care of these things. We got to take care of our kids. Not only ours, the world's kids. Because something that happens there, it's not, we're 35 years old. Okay, throw me in the washing machine a little bit. I'll be okay. Don't put a kid in the washing machine.
I'll give you another example because you have, you have other forms of abuse. So let's say um, someone being hit one time. We agree that most likely, I don't know if we agree, I don't know if you agree or not, most likely, like if I was only hit one time in childhood, I think I'd be pretty good. Right, right, right. <laughs> one time, like, hey, like there's a lot of, you know, I think the number is, I think most, most of us need, I think somewhere between eight and 10 positive experiences per negative experience for us to be okay. And the minimum is three, like three to one. So we can dilute certain kind of experiences. And I think like if being hit one time, that experience could be, could be diluted by a lot of good parenting. Being sexually abused one time can't be diluted by a lot of good parenting, certainly if it wasn't by the parent itself. Right. Certainly not. How do you, like, right. how is that undone? There's a healing path for it, but that child is going to have a, a, a scar. Right. Let's imagine this child was hit one time by their teacher in front of their class, you know, and brought to complete embarrassment and shame in front of everyone. Is that experience enough to leave someone tarnished for a long time? It's possible. I think so. Yeah, for right. sure. I think so. So what is that touching? And that, that feels like much more um, emotional than it is the, the physical exactly. act, right? right? So going back to your point. That's a short, right. That's another pathway in. Right. Right. So if you have our, the spirit and the spirit is like our sexuality maybe is a really close ring right around it. Right. And then emotional, our psyche, right? So psychological abuse, emotional abuse. And then the furthest ring, not disconnected certainly, is um, our physical parts. And all of these are pathways in. There's only one form of abuse when we're using that language. There's injury, but there's one form of abuse. And the abuse is all spiritual. It's spiritual abuse. And then there's, pathway, there's pathways into it. Right, abuse of the spirit. And what is the healing? So how do we heal? Yeah, how do we heal? Spirit. We reawaken it. We reconnect with it. And then we reintegrate it with the rest of... So give me some practical steps uh, to, to how we heal the spirit. Because the people want to know. I get these messages all the time. Yeah, it's not on one foot. It's not, it's not on one foot, but like, where do you, where do you start? So what is it, like that spirit, right? That, a broken spirit. How does one heal a broken, fractured, chipped spirit? So we, um, I, I think like in my case, we start believing stuff about ourselves. We start believing things about the world. So let's, um, let's say someone was on the other end. I mentioned this guy who abused a few people who I spoke with. So someone is on the other end of that. What is the damage? Let's say he was on the other end of an attempt, never sexual abuse. What is the damage? So what I argued, the damage was that his innocence was exploited. He can no longer trust in the same way. Mm. He doesn't see the world through the same positive lens that he did previously. And he doesn't see himself through the same positive lens that he did. Maybe on some level, I don't know what beliefs he took on, but maybe on some level, he believes that he was easily fooled. He's stupid. And that's why this guy was able to, I can't believe that I trusted this guy for so many months and really all this was about was this. So now the belief that he's taken on himself is that I'm stupid. The belief that he's taken on the world is that it's dangerous. No one can be trusted. That's an unhealed, broken spirit. So where do we go back? We go back into the spirit. We nurture it. We work with it and everything else. And I'll make one more point Another form, I, with spirit and spiritual, I like the word because I have made the argument previously that there is a level of experiences of pain that many of us go through that the only way out is a spiritual solution. Mm -hmm. Meaning the only solution is one of believing that there was a purpose to it. I found meaning through my story. I found a purpose through it. Does that make any sense? That yeah. meaning and purpose? Yeah, yeah, for how sure. Does that, how does that jive with... I mean, you're on the path. Yeah. So how does that... Finding meaning and purpose through the painful experiences, how does that jive with? Yeah, and as, as I mean, for me, as someone that, that doesn't believe anything is coincidental or just on a whim, um, I wholeheartedly believe that now, uh, uh, asterisks, like now I believe that everything is, is part of the process, part of the journey. I didn't always, right? Um, very much there's been times where I'm like, you know, why me or... I can't believe this is happening. Um, but yeah, I think, I think now if it's happened to you, there's a reason, whether it's obvious or subconscious. So, and you so just meaning, there's meaning. Always meaning. Okay, so let's take a difficult experience that you've spoken about previously, um, watching your mom try to commit suicide. Have you been able to find any meaning in, in that? Because if nothing is a coincidence, that's not either. 
Right. Um, I haven't found a meaning in that, um, but I know why also, because it's not something that I fully started to um, put any energy into figuring out. I haven't started looking for the meaning in that yet. It's very much, and just kind of how it happened, right? Like it, it happened and then it was never talked about, never um, discussed inside the house, never just, as I told you before, like most of my life it was referred to as the accident when it obviously wasn't an right. accident. You so, knew it wasn't. Right. So, um, yeah, I haven't, I haven't been able to, to really wrestle with that yet and find the meaning in that. Um, but what I will say so, recently... So what have you done that you're able to speak about it more comfortably now? Because there was a time that you weren't able to at all. The first time I saw you... I uh, let go of some of the it. shame around it, or all the shame around it. The shame. Shame, shame, being ashamed of that because what was happening, even it happened when I was a, a child. And like some of like the most profound memories around it is knowing what happened, but my mother, my caretaker, my father, my what, not talking about it, B, calling it something else, and C, having to cover up something that was obvious, meaning when friends, like curiosity of young kids, oh, why does your mother's chest and neck look like that? Right. Oh, I, I don't know. It's, and try to make up some story. A shame, like crazy amount of shame. I didn't recognize it then, but I do now. And just being able to let go of that is what allowed me to be able to speak about it without, I, at one point I couldn't talk about it without tearing up. Right. That's, you know, that's I, what and I was, to. yeah. And I just think about what you're saying and that just, um, the emotion of shame, right? To, to, we to your early example about, of about yeah. like if a kid gets physically abused in front of a class, the embarrassment there, mm -hmm. but it's like akin to shame. It's like shame is right, right on the heels of embarrassment, right? hundred percent. And uh, yeah, for me, Sh shame is almost that internalized embarrassment. Yeah, for sure. A hundred percent. So yeah, to answer your it question, it becomes me in some way. There's yeah. something about me that I must hide. Right. And I certainly try to hide whatever that is, but everyone knew, like you had to know, right. If you had half but a, notice, but so notice what you spoke about, right. You have this extremely traumatic experience mm -hmm. of watching your mother try to burn herself alive. Mm -hmm. And what you talk about is the damage around there was ancillary things, having to hide it, right. not talk about it, pretend it wasn't so. Right. Friends ask questions. So that, that's what I'm talking about when I'm saying the spirit damaged. That's, it's all of those things that those aren't related to the abuse. Yeah. Like, oh, you have to hide something from your friend. Yeah, that's the stuff that touches us because what am I hiding? They can't truly know me because if they knew me, they wouldn't want to be my friends. Right. Why would they want to have anything to do with me if they understood that part of me? That's, that's the message. And when we start believing those things, that's a broken spirit. Right. And, and, and just even more like a byproduct of, of a, having a broken spirit, I, Again, looking back at it now, I opened myself up to manipulation. Like, that's what followed after. Like, a person, one parent became the bad guy, the other one became the victim. Right. But inside of that, there was crazy manipulation happening. It wasn't, it, the story that was being told to me wasn't the complete story. And you knew it on some level. Yeah, I felt it on some level because the parent that became the bad guy, my dad, who's, it's obvious, right? Right. Like, I loved him. Like, this is my guy. So not liking him anymore felt unnatural to me. So how did he Because he's the, never done anything. How did he become the bad guy in this story? Because my mother started to paint the story that her, her act of attempted suicide was his fault. And you knew otherwise. I didn't know otherwise. Not until recently, years later, within the last five, six years, I sat down with my dad because... That just kind of spun and spun and spun and to where me and my father became estranged. Like I just didn't, wasn't, you know. But when I, if I sit and I, and I thought to it, like he's never, all he's done is try to take care of me. All he's done is try to do his best. I couldn't understand it then and certainly didn't consider his perspective and what he grew up in. But there was something you knew as a child. You were saying there was something you knew as a child. Yeah, it felt unnatural that like. That was not true. Right, because I, Right. So there was a lie in there that you already knew as a child, and there was a further lie that right. your dad had something to do with it right. that was exposed as an adult. Yeah, for sure. Got it. Okay. 
Meaning, I'm listen. I, it, there's a dysfunctional relationship by anybody's definition, right? So no right. one's innocent in in that dysfunction, but it certainly wasn't lopsided. It wasn't a good guy, bad guy, right? And that's the way you were forced to believe as a child, right? And especially when your dad's no longer in your life, right? Right. So now we understand why we start believing some of these things. Because when your mom's your only caretaker, I'm going to have to go along with the story. I'm certainly not going to challenge it. And there's a part of me that really wants to go along with the story because she's the person I depend on for survival. Right. But then it doesn't really match. So then what happens? Your spirit is broken. There's something, it's not whole. And that's the, the, re, the revival of oneself. You want one part of it is like the revival comes through honesty. You know, said differently, sunlight is said to be the best of disinfectants. Right? Bringing like truth to a situation, that's the way... That's the way we heal it. Yeah, I agree. As one, as one step in the process, right? You're not going to remove the infection. And we have a, another podcast, I don't remember the name, where we spoke about kind of the three stages of healing. A, remove the infection. B, find the meaning in the, in, in the experience. C, develop a purpose off of it. That's kind of the three stages. The difference between meaning and purpose is meaning is more internal and purpose is always something that's external, right? That the world or others benefit from. So I like that. So from, from a practical standpoint, our, our first step would be to, to, to shine light, to be honest and truthful. Yeah, which is a lot of what which you've done. Which is the work, right? Right. And it was very healing, for example, for you to sit there and have that conversation with your dad. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It was, it was crazy. And you remember, like... I remember. I told him, like, you know, he's coming into town and we locked ourselves in the Airbnb and... I remember the for jitters the first, before. Yeah, crazy the conversation jitters. with you just before you went in. Yeah. yeah, and and just sitting there and just for the first time in my life, him telling me his side of it, right, and realizing that he wasn't even equipped with properly to be a father. Like he's literally doing his best, you know. And I saw it for something else. Yeah, so for you sure you were told to see it for something I else. Was told, yeah, honestly. Um, yeah, but the truth shall set you free. And those kind of things, right? That manipulation that you're talking about, that psychological abuse. That's the term we use for it. But really, 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 what are we talking about at the end of the day is spirituality being abused. And the spirit the, being it's abused. It's the spirit being abused. I'm sorry, it's our spirit being abused. And it's also why, because the spirit is untouchable and can always heal. And that's why healing is possible, is because the problem is the solution. The problem is that we have a spirit and it gets abused, and our spirit's broken, and we have the capacity to walk around not believing in ourselves, not believing that there's um, someone who's directing this that really cares about what's, what's happening to us. We stop believing all of those things. Our spirit's broken, but then it could be revived the other way because it's our spirit, because it's not, like, the less tangible something is, the more it can, you know, the more it can come back to life. Yeah, I dig that. And uh, just one note on this, like an, an appendix to this point, is religious abuse and why I think it's, it's so dangerous. So what's religious abuse? Religious abuse would be a child sexually abused and the person on the other end of that is, is, is a religious figure. Mm. Another way of saying that is godly abuse. Abuse with the name of God. I'm going to say in the name of God. That's different. It's with the name of God. A teacher is not saying, some are. Some are saying, you know, God instructed me to do A, B, and C, and therefore, you know, I am the guru and you are the disciple and this is what's going to happen. This is some sort of, you know, if you, there's um, a show on Netflix about some Indian guru guy who was uh, abusing his. Um, oh, yeah, yeah. I, I forget know. what it's called, the yoga yeah. master guy. And, and right, the woman behind him. So a lot of those things he was, I forget what it's called, but a lot of those things he was, um, a lot of the, the manipulation strategy he was using, he was abusing in the name of God. I am, and I'm going to heal you, you know, right. with, and he would use um, some sort of Eastern term for his penis, and I'm going to, you know, do with this, whatever, some sort of healing uh, um, thing. That's abusing in the name of right. God. But sometimes there's abuse with the name of God, meaning it's, this person is a rabbi and a religious figure or a priest and uh, someone is sexually abused by a priest. There's two things going on there at the same time. And one of those is religious abuse. It's abuse with the name of God. So later on, and why is that so dam damaging is because that's the way out. 
I mean, the way through is for the spirit to heal, for the spirit to revive itself, for us to start believing again in that. Right? So often when I'm working with someone, like the only thing I want them to believe is that, for, for lack of a better word, that they're a son of God, mm. right? That they're a child of, of, of God. And I don't mean this in religious ways, a, a son of the universe, a daughter of the universe, a child of something. These are not mistakes. These are not coincidences. There's something going on here that's much bigger and larger, and you're a child of that. Right. We're a child of that, and people we forget that we get disconnected from that. It becomes too painful, so we cut that off, and it becomes especially so. That becomes a like a, a seal on the way out when there is re, when there is religious abuse. And to me, that's why religious abuse is so damaging when it comes with the name of God, and even more so in the name of God. Then it's so difficult for people to heal. And this is, you know, part of my story. Even though I wasn't abused by a um, a, a rabbi. I wasn't abused by a religious figure, but my whole life was dictated by it. Every aspect of my life, uh, the clothes we wore, the place we lived in, the um, order of the, our shoes we put on, the beds we slept in, everything was dictated by this religion. And it was communicated as this is a system that's... Um, Instructed by God's God favor. and all aspects of God, the Torah are being followed in this system. Mm -hmm. And this is what we're creating. We're working here as a community to create this. And every single decision, we go to a, a, a religious um, figure to tell us, is this okay? Is this not okay? And every aspect of our life is dictated. So in that context, when someone grows up in that and you're saying, okay, you're in the soup, <laughs> like you're in the soup of God, this is it. We've just created a, a life that every single aspect of it has been curated and cultured and ordered, right? In order to create what it looks like to have an experience. You cannot have a television in your house. You cannot use the, wear these kind of clothes. You cannot listen to this kind of music. And in that context, abuse happens. It was communicated on a sublim subliminal level that all of this is God. All of this is somehow sanctioned. All of this is somehow mm. reviewed and okay. Right. And then at those first signs that I started to want to talk about it and it's not received in the right way, then that becomes religious abuse. Who's not receiving it? These people who have told me that they're living their whole lives in the name of God. So they're not rabbis, but they've told me that every aspect of their life is dictated by it. And then I'm not blaming them. I'm explaining what the effect is on the healing process. That's what we talk about here. And the effect is that it makes it that much more difficult to heal because the spirit now is blocked off because we, we have the belief that we've already tried it. I've already tried this godly way. And here's another thing. With all my spirit. With all my heart. Everything. I was in it 100%. It. Yeah. Right. No, no, everything. Every, you know, right. head to toes. We were immersed in this. Right. Morning to night. Immersed in this. This was that's how I grew up. Yeah, every I, aspect of our life. I agree. That that makes it the danger just ten x. We got to get it right. Right. And when we get it wrong, then that's one of the more difficult things to involve in the healing process. It's like you start talking to someone who grew up the way I did about spirituality, about the fact that there is a spirit. A, words like God or universe or any words you want and we recoil and freeze. I've already tried that. I know where that leads me. I know where that takes me. But that's what we're looking to do to heal is to revive the spirit. So religious abuse, right, like that side of it, what I would say is it's like a cover on the spirit and it's like something that needs to be thrown off in, in, order, to, in order to heal. So there's kind of the, those two work together. Someone whose spirit is abused through any of the many channels I mentioned. And then when we throw on that, and this is the case for so many of us in different ways because, you know, especially in America, we, we're all, many of us are connected to a religion in one form or another. And so many of, of it is communicated in that way, especially my life, my life a thousand percent so. And it made it extremely difficult to embrace the solution that I found. It was one more, I was, like, they got me coming and going, <laughs> so to speak. That's a lot. And hopefully people that are listening to this can can take your your perspectives and your words and and use it in their whole in their or their own healing process. Certainly just having these conversations with you on and off camera, it's just because one, you're you're not the same as me. 
obviously and not so obviously, right? So in a lot of ways, but it's a genuine connection between us. So I'm able to listen to your experience experiences more objectively and just kind of take it in and see how the similarity is like to the roots, you right. know? So yeah, let's fix those broken spirits. That's what we got to shine do. the light. Let's be truthful and be that's, honest. That's the message. That is 100% the message. And so many times when we start with the truth, people recoil. And what are you doing? You're going to hurt us. You're going to destroy us. No. No, it's all healing. It's all love. But we got to start with a little sunlight. It's all love. Let's bring it on. <laughs>